welcome back to the 1%. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in here on YouTube or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Um, welcome back to another episode. We've got a really cool one in store for, for you today. Um, the topic is going to be what you would have seen from the thumbnail and the titles is all about sales. So today we've brought on a sales expert. His name is Charles Schwen. He owns a company called Flying Kite, which you can see at www.flyingkite.co.za. Charles is a sales and marketing expert who's worked with a bunch of incredible corporates and individuals around South Africa. How's it going, Charles? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm very, very excited, Gideon. I'm actually honored because I've been admiring your work from afar. So it's my absolute pleasure to be on the show. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And yeah, just off the bat, I just want to say welcome and, and thank you so much. I've obviously listened to quite a few of your own podcasts and uh, I was lucky enough to be on your podcast, which I'm sure will come out soon. And yeah, I just, I just want people to know who are listening to this, that this is something that I would have set up to chat to you just for fun, honestly, just to learn from you and, and, and to, to bounce ideas off you. And the fact that we can record this and share, share this with my network and my friends, um, I, I really appreciate that. So thank you for your time today. Awesome, man. Pleasure is mine. So if we're going to be diving into sales over the next 30 minutes, um, I want to start with this guy here, which we chatted a little, about, a little bit about before we started, <laughs> Mr. Jordan Belfort. Uh, people who are, who are listening to this who can't see, I'm holding up his book called The Way of the Wolf. Uh, Jordan Belfort, you'll know from the, the movie by Martin Scorsese, The Wolf of Wall Street, very, very famous character in the business world. Um, off the bat, I want to ask you, Charles, have you, have you heard anything about him in terms of his straight line sales? Um, what is, what is your, your first impression about Mr. Jordan Belfort? Uh, two areas. One, I've seen the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street. Great. You know, they, Martin does amazing storytelling. Uh, he's good at what he does, obviously. He's uh, made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, some shady, some not so shady, but such is life. And he's obviously good at selling. He's a great communicator for people to buy into his ideas. I did get a chance to see him in South Africa a few years ago, uh, but unfortunately, I got tired of waiting because I think he came on. The show started at nine o'clock. Was a whole day event. He only came on, I think, six o'clock or seven o'clock. So I, I had to hear it via the grapevine. I didn't get a chance to see him live in South Africa. Yeah, that would have been awesome. Yeah. Yep. He's very, like you said, a very good communicator. Can like get a crowd going, get you inspired. Um, from what I've seen, he's got quite a few talks on YouTube where he sort of shares like, it's kind of like sales training talks that have slipped through the cracks and made their way onto YouTube. And I must say they are phenomenal. Like it's not hard to believe like when you watch the movie that he was good at doing what he did. Mm. Look, one of, one of the things that he, like what I've noticed with a lot of uh, salespeople, because I mean, I've been doing this for the past 15 years. And one of the things I have noticed is character traits. You need to be confident. And mm. he's confident. He's like, I've, 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 I've seen people do presentations and they're not presenting. They are reading. They're reading everything off the slide. That is not, you should know your material. And when you do that, you don't exactly show confidence. I've, I've, I've literally seen presenters talk about their topic uh, as they say business consulting. Then they'll go, so the next slide, oh, whoa, whoa, sorry, that's nice. That slide, it's not supposed to be there. Yeah. Oh, I don't actually know what that slide is. You're already gone. You, you're gone you're gone yeah. um so I'm, confidence is, is definitely i've seen that as a key trait I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that word up confidence because uh the way that jordan talks about it in this book is they use the word certainty which i assume is the, is the exact same thing it's it's confidence in in what you're selling in yourself in the company that you represent and so they use the word certainty and they use it to great effect in this book and the way that they they use it and i want to get your your opinion on this mm. as the expert is they say that you should have uh, three areas in which you create certainty and these okay. three areas so imagine it almost like on a scale so like a one to ten scale of confidence right or of certainty so you got to try to get people that that you're selling to so hot or warm leads or uh, potential buyers you, you got to try uh, get them as close to a 10 as possible in these three areas and you don't know where they are when they start off they could be at an eight they could be at a one you have no clue but your your objective is to find out where they are and then try to move them to a 10 on, on these three areas so the first area is in the product itself so whatever you're selling let's say you're selling an iphone this is this is the, the product and you got to get them to a, a, a high level of certainty in the product the second thing is a high level of certainty in yourself as a salesperson, that you're somebody that they can trust, that they can rely on, an expert in your field. And then the third area is uh, get them to a level of certainty in the organization that you represent. 
So in the, in the brand or the company that you represent. And if you can get people who are potential buyers, I'm not talking about non-buyers, you can get them to believe in your product, to believe in you and to believe in the brand or the company you represent, then that's sort of the sweet spot where you can, uh, you can convert them and you can make the sale. I just want to get your, your reaction to that. And am I oversimplifying it? Uh, are there other things that people should consider? What do you think about that? Those three things, definitely. But that's only one-sided. Now, the mistake, and, I, and just think about when you get a phone call from telesales, they, one thing they, they don't do, correct me if I'm wrong, they don't ask you a single question. I find that is one big mistake salespeople don't do. They don't ask you enough questions. They don't ask you, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. So I started my sales career in uh, short-term insurance to, purely by accident. Okay. And if I, may, if I may, I know this might be a long, long-winded answer, but I really fell into insurance by accident. Now, I, st- I studied finance and I wanted to be in, 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 in banking. So I worked for the banking industry for about six years, but I hated my job. Like, I'm not making this up. I live in Pretoria and the company was in Rosebank. So it's a 40, 45K drive. Every day I go to work, I used to say to myself, please let the car break down so I can come up with an excuse and not go to work. It was that bad. Eventually I was like, peace out. And then uh, my parents were mad. I was 24 and unemployed. And then by chance I got into selling, uh, which was short term insurance. And then I actually discovered I'm actually pretty good at this. It, it came really natural to me. Now, so that's, that's a long-winded answer. But when it comes to sales, because in short-term insurance, let me give you an example. You, you, you spoke about the product. Absolutely, you have to be, have product knowledge. You have to be confident. You have to believe in the company because people can spot if you are just reading. Hmm. But the problem comes in people don't ask questions. So I need to, because if I don't ask you enough questions, how do I know what your pain points are? Mm. Otherwise, a product is a product is a product. So cell phone, as an example, I will first ask you, like, uh, what do you use your cell phone for? Do you mainly, are you concerned about the battery life? Is it stability? Is it security? Is it uh, to take amazing photos? Find out more. Like, what do you use it for? If somebody needs a, a top end of security one, then you know, okay, that's the pain point. Then you ask them, okay, have you had a breach before? Uh, why are you so concerned about uh, security? You know, to have you had your identity stolen? You know, um, you know, you find out. Or if somebody say camera, they 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 want uh, the phone to have good camera. Find out more. Do you are you big on Instagram? You know, find out a little bit more. Then you can see, okay, these are because when you're doing that, you're getting small clues. Aha, uh-huh. this is what they like. I need to sell on this. I need to sell on that. Because let's say if you are somebody that only uses it for phone calls, like old school people, phone calls and SMS, why should I tell you about the cool feature about this app and that app? You don't need it. Like if I have to tell it to my mom, she'll be like, I don't need it. Same. So you can have great product knowledge. You can believe in your company, but she doesn't need it. Mm. So asking question, it is so vital. It is so vital. Next time I'm trying to do this, where the telesales people phone you, just, just go along, entertain them. And, and just ask them like, have you noticed that, uh, okay, another way of putting it is, how I explain it is, have you ever been on a date? I put this question to them. Have you ever been on a date when the person just talks about themselves? Mm. Oh, wow, you know, I make so much money. I work for this company. I'm the manager of this place, that, that place, I'm number one. I'm the greatest, I'm in shape. You don't want to speak to that person again, but that's what they're doing. They jam, they're trying to jam everything down your throat before asking you a single question. Why would you want to talk to them? Mm, mm. So that's, so absolutely those three, but they need to ask questions to find out a little bit more. Like when you go to a doctor, if a doctor says, let's say, let's say again, let's say you come to a doctor and you say, hey doctor, I've got a headache. And the doctor say, oh, uh, book you in for hot bypass, hot bypass tomorrow. What would you say? You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You haven't asked me my history, my blood pressure. You haven't taken my temperature, my blood pressure. Yeah. You see, you, see, you have to ask questions. Ask yeah. more and more and more. Then you understand. Okay. So I think the doctors, they normally ask at least 10 or was it 10 or 12 or 20, one of those. But they ask you certain enough of question, uh, amount of questions before diagnosing you. It's the same thing. And these, would you call these in your industry uh, like qualifying questions or? 
qualifying questions in in a way in a way so i'll give you another example. So, so in car insurance for example when i meet the phone people i'll say to them my name is so so the reason why i'm phoning you is because of this and this and this i believe so let's say gideon i believe you probably own a car and really have car insurance yes okay have you had claim in the last three years no and how much money has your insurance company given you money back mm -hmm. you will say nothing Really, what I mean if I tell you that because you've got such an amazing profile, I will actually give you money back. Mm -hmm. uh, then I'm not pushing. Then I'm getting you to say, well, tell me more. Mm -hmm. And then I say to them, look, you know what? If I cannot give you a better deal, you at least know your current company gave you the best deal. So you have a peace of mind. So if you do that, why on earth will they say no to you? I can you see, see that the, yeah? the, ins the insurance yeah. lines are, are, are deeply ingrained in your DNA still. You've got those burnt in here. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, you know what? The, the amazing thing is some of the lines that we, 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 we came up with. So I was in the insurance industry in 2004. This is a long time ago. Okay. Some, of the, the, some of the stuff that we came up with, when they phoned me from the same company, they were, they, they're using it on me. I'm like, dude, we came up with those lines. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're going to say next. And I actually finished their sentence for them. Then they get stumped. I'm like, yes, because I used those lines for 14, 15 years ago. It's time to evolve, yeah. buddy. Yeah. That normally yeah. stumps them. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I really like the point of asking questions because I mean, how can you position yourself to solve a problem for somebody with the product or service if you don't really show them that you understand what their pain points are? So yeah, I think that would be like, like our major sort of first point of, of this chat today is, is ask those questions and really, really take the time and energy to find out what your prospect needs. And, and yes. not just in a, like a sort of a fake shallow type of way, like, you know, get it done, ask the questions and then unload the, the products, but genuinely like find out what, what their problems are. Because I think most people are also, they, they're good at, at um, sensing if you're listening to them and sensing if you really care about what they, what they are trying to, you know, solve. Yeah. And just on, just on that, that point about, about pain, right? The, it can be seen also external, internal pain. Let me give you an example. Now, during the lockdown, I don't know, I think this was maybe April or May. Did you notice how high everybody's grass were? Nobody was mm -hmm. mowing their grass. You right. notice that, right? Yeah. Because no garden service was available. It was getting messier, messier. So let's use that as an example of pain. In internal, external. External is my garden looks like crap. Like I'm, I'm freaking ashamed of my garden. I don't want people to drive past and see, whoa, look at Charles's garden. It's horrible. External pain. Internal pain is I haven't mown the lawn since I was in high school. I need to actually find the, like, how the heck do you do this? I need to find out how, how to operate without uh, cutting the cable or, or cutting my nail, uh, cutting my, my, my toes off by accident. Yeah. And on top of that, my wife might be nagging in my ear. That's the internal pain. And that you can find out from asking questions, internal, external. So when you come up with your marketing, so the guy that came along, I chatted to him and I kind of briefly, he listened carefully and he, he said, Charles, look at the gardens on your left, on your right and in front of you. I'm like, yeah, they, my neighbor's garden looks pretty good. He said, that's my work. Mm. We are in and out in 90 minutes. No mess, no fuss, once a week. We bring our own equipment. You don't need to supply anything. We don't even use your electricity. He, yeah. solved my, he spoke to my internal and external problem in one go. And a year later, still using him just yeah. by asking questions. Yeah. Instead of saying, hey, here's a pamphlet, use us. We're yeah. the cheapest. Yeah, yeah. We cut grass 5% faster than the other guy and we are this and this and this. We haven't Whoopie actually do. figured out what the problems are. Yeah. Exactly. That's such a, and I really want to stress this because this is such a key point uh, in this conversation. So, I mean, if that's one thing that, that people who are listening to this, whether you're a business owner or you're selling in a, in a corporate, I think that's the most important thing is like take the time to ask questions. Um, I'd like to change gears quickly and, and ask you about um, first impressions. How important are first, first impressions? Um, how long do they stay with somebody when you're speaking to them? So if I have a terrible start, I mean, is it possible to recover over the next 10, 20 minutes? Um, and also like, how does it change versus being in person to a situation like this where people are speaking on Zoom and over the phone? So maybe you can share some of your insights and personal uh, thoughts on first impression. Look, first impression is important, but first impression is very deceiving. Okay. Again, I'll refer back to dating because we've all dated before. And I hope 
whoever's listening, you are of age and you are dating, you you have data, so you know what we're talking about. Something when a boy meets girl. Now, first impression is, is deceiving because everybody first impression they can they can be their best self. You can be your best self, best behavior in for one hour, two hours, but it takes time to know the person's character. Yeah. Have I seen some mess up on first impressions? Yes, I have. But I always say to myself, perhaps that bad, that, that person had a really bad day. Mm. Perhaps they just had a fight with their partner. Perhaps their kids are giving them trouble. Perhaps they had just came back from load shedding or, or maybe, maybe they didn't get a good night's sleep. And then I was trying to find out a little bit more. I'll give the person the benefit of the doubt and you'll be surprised. At character, I, I think character is, is the most important thing. But that, again, that will take time because I believe that uh, it's, it's a relationship. I prefer to work with people that I like. So yeah. if you don't have the same value as me, doesn't matter how much you're willing to spend with me, I'd rather say no. So for, and, and when it comes to Zoom, I think it's been almost a year. So people should have time to sort out their workstation by now. Mm. For example, get a decent background if you don't have the best background um, proper lighting invest in something called a ring light which is what i'm using now you know if i switch off this light i'm going to look like i'm on like special assignments which you only see like half of my eye you know <laughs> and it's so investing in something like that you've had time to adjust yeah a ring light doesn't cost that much money and uh, i just found this out uh, when there's low shedding ring light can substitute for a floodlight you just, oh, cool. plug, it into, you just plug it into a power bank with some this other accident. Know. The South Africans listening to this will know how important that is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so that, for example, and uh, one thing that I have seen, which I, I do when I'm doing talks is when you're presenting, don't sit, stand mm. up. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Stand up because you're, it, you're, I can talk to you with as much energy as possible, but I'm sitting. Yeah. You'll notice that you'll notice the difference when you stand. So whenever I'm delivering a, a, a keynote or presentation, I always stand. Yeah. Standing is very important. And uh, the most important thing is ask questions. Back if to the if you are doing, if you are, if you, so if I, if I'm meeting a client for the first time, 70% is about them. 30% is about me. And yeah. I cannot stress enough research ahead of time. Yeah. Like how many times have you seen LinkedIn people do LinkedIn messages to you and you can yeah. see it's copy paste. I hate that so much. I'd, I'd like to get onto that as well. Once we've broken through some of these fundamentals, I would, I would definitely like to chat about some of those, those sort of like modern day practices that you see these, these cold LinkedIn messages and stuff, but let's get to that uh, uh, down the line. Um, so I want to talk to you about this first impression and, and say like, um, I watched a video where they said there's really three things that you want to you want to get across when you're f with your first impression with somebody that you've you've never met. Um, the one is that you want to you want to show them that you're sharp, that you're on the ball, that you're somebody who's you know who's who's with it and who can help them. That's the first thing. The second thing is that you're enthusiastic, so you know what it's like when you speak to someone and they're just so down. They're taking long mm -hmm. pauses between their sentences, and it's almost like they're typing with dot dot dot. I mean, that's not somebody who's, who's there, who's going to help you with your products, who's excited to, I mean, to help you with your problem, who's got a good product. So you want to be mm. sharp, you want to be enthusiastic. And then the last one is you want to be an expert in your field. And mm. so I think this is one that, that I really want to get your feedback on is that uh, we've been trained like throughout our lives to trust the expert, right? You use the analogy of going to a doctor earlier. So if you go to a doctor's office and let's say the doctor's assistant or the trainee comes and speaks to you and says, hey, like, this is what's going on with you. You're going to say, please, I'll wait for the doctor's advice. Thank you very much. Like, you, we'll <laughs> take it from here. Thank you. Let's, let's yeah. speak to the expert. When mm -hmm. your garage door breaks or something happens, you, you bring in the expert in, in their field to come and help you. So we've been trained uh, as, a, as a society to believe in uh, or to trust and, and confide in the experts in their field. So how important do you think it is to show people that you're enthusiastic, you're sharp as a tack, and you're an expert in your field? Absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial. Now, now to be an expert, um, uh, let me use this analogy. Why it's so important. I saw this happening in, in my own working career. Now, I heard this uh, analogy from uh, a person which I mentioned to you before, Douglas Kruger. So Douglas, if you're listening to this, I'm giving you props. 
So Douglas wrote a book about uh, expert positioning. And uh, till this day, I still remember. So the analogy he begins with is the, the pie man and the guru. So imagine on a, on a, on a, on a cold winter's day, there's a, there's a long queue of people lined up, right? Outside, outside of a venue, let's say without, without COBRA. So let's pick a place, Santon Convention Center. There's a long queue there. And the pie man tap on people's shoulder to say, hey, would you like a pie? 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 By sheer volume, he will make sales. Yeah. But who are those people queuing to see? The guru. Yeah. You see, it's, so that, 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 is, that in itself, when I read that, I'm like, yes. And also three things that he mentioned, which I, which I think is absolutely feel like it's essential. You need three things to be an expert. You need to know your stuff, experience. Mm -hmm. you, need, you, need to, you need to have a personality. And then you need to have airtime. Okay. okay. So, so let me use that as an example. Let's think of, uh, if I say bodybuilding, who would you think of? Um, maybe like Ronnie Coleman. Okay. And who else? Steve Cook. Actor. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Here we go. Okay. Uh, Arnie, I think Arnie is pushing 70 now. Yeah. Yeah. He hasn't. That's my point. But people still think of him. Yeah, true. There, there are people that's won Mr. Olympia more than Arnie. So the record itself is not, but he has a personality. Yeah. And he has the airtime. Same as Jamie Oliver. Jamie mm -hmm. Oliver, he's not the best chef. There are a lot more trained chef, but he has yeah. a personality and he has airtime. Yeah. See? That's such a good. So, and, and, and when it comes, that's why it's so important to, to be able to communicate. I mean, have you ever had a school teacher that is so smart, but they don't know how to teach? Yeah, I've come across many people like that. Yeah. Sometimes exactly. the smartest people. Sometimes they don't, they, yeah, they don't, they don't know. It's kind of like Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. He, yeah. She's so smart. You think everybody's dumb. It yeah. doesn't help. You need to help. To, that's why communication is so freaking crucial. And another example that, 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 that I tell people is uh, there's a 90% chance that you will be able to recall the, the movie scene or your favorite childhood story or favorite quote from a book. You can recall that. But Gideon, if I had to ask you to list out the five points of the last business presentation you attended last week, click, click. Yeah. There we go. So imagine every single time you present to a client, this is what happens. As soon as the meeting ends, they forget everything. Yeah. That is why it's so important to clarify your message as a way to make more sales. Yeah. Because you spend all that time into presentation, and as soon as people click end, the, the, one of the mistakes that I see people make is they're trying to jam too much information. Mm. It's kind of like when you drive on the highway, there's so many billboards. And sometimes you see the billboard text is so small or SMS this number. I'm like, do you really want me to go in 120, slam on my brakes, remember the number and, and SMS? Yeah. Well, they're saying so much information. It's like, what do you want me to remember? So one of the key thing is, what do you want the, the audience to remember three days, three weeks, three months from now on? Just one thing. And, and do you have advice on how people can, can think of this one thing for their sales pitch and then uh, sort of implant it in, the, in that meeting? Is there, are there ways of, I mean, how do you work with your, your clients and your businesses to help them find that one thing that's memorable? Like an example would be like sometimes when they say like, you know, when you go out to a bar, if you want to meet girls or something, wear one piece of clothing that's kind of like out there, you know, wear like a bright jacket, <laughs> or a pair of sneakers, something different about you that they remember. Is there a similar thing uh, for sales that you this is people? yes this is where, where where research comes into play so to give you an idea and i've made this a habit now before i meet a, 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 a potential client i'll research them so your your linkedin but not just your linkedin i need to i'm trying to build a profile in my head so let's say um linkedin right okay i'll see what this person study if he or she does study what's what field did they study in how long have they been at the current company did they get a promotion? Are they a job hopper? Because then you can get an idea. So, I, I, so let me use advertising as an example. If I see somebody with a, a marketing background and study marketing, then cool, I can speak some lingos or some joggers because they study it. But mm -hmm. if I see somebody with a finance background, then I speak numbers and stats. If I see somebody with a BA, I paint them a picture. Yeah, yeah. 
So it's a, it's and also go go a step further, um, especially like when I as, as an example when I do my 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 podcast, I always do research on my guests. I I will go listen to their previous talks. Um, I'll listen to the previous podcast. I'll make notes. Yeah, I'll make notes because it's showing respect. I've 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 had and I've, I I take it as a compliment. I've had it a few times. Clients say to me, "You really have done your homework," because mm. I'll know what the latest article is by the company, who published it, what they spoke about. It's just a sign of respect. So when it comes to sales, I see there's there's the shotgun approach, you know, spray and pray, <clears throat> and of yeah. course, shotgun you will hit target. But it's all over the place. I prefer to be a sniper. I take my time. I get to know you, and then I connect. I'm not going to take you out because I'm not trying to take out my client. Because that's just you know, I'm trying to connect. Yeah, yeah. But, but but that's just my approach. I mean, some people, it's like they like they kind of spray and pray. It's like kind of kind of like hanging out flyers by the road sign by sheer numbers. Of course, somebody will pick up the 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 flyers in. Yeah. And, uh, no, I really like your, your analogy of being a sniper instead of a shotgun. And I guess like um, today, in today's day and age, like we have these, these new channels that maybe people didn't have back in the day. You know, we have LinkedIn, we have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, we have uh, Google ads. Um, so there's many, many different ways to, you know, to find people who are potential buyers, right? So I want to start with LinkedIn and I want to get your, your opinion on this because I know you've got a lot of experience working with brands and, and businesses uh, on LinkedIn and on social media mm -hmm. as well. So I, I hate it. Like I personally hate it so much when you add somebody and there's an automated message saying straight hey, away, Gideon. right? Within seconds, right? Within seconds, within seconds. And it says, it starts off well, it says, Hey Gideon, or it'll for you, it'll say, Hey Charles. And you think, wow, that's great. You know, a personal message. And then it's just a copy and pasted paragraph all about them and their business and how they need help. And please check me, me, out. me, 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 me. It's called the eye specialist. Mm -hmm. Me, 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 me. Exactly. And, and I, I just archive those. I, I never read them. I never respond. I never even say thanks for, for sending this. I just archive all of them. I want to know from your side, what, how do you respond to those LinkedIn messages? And then let's, let's get your opinion on how we can tear them apart and, and do, do that it, in a better way. I'll tell you what I do with them. I actually keep them and I use them as case studies. Oh, cool. I use them during my workshops and I actually take screenshots. Obviously, I blur out the person's name in their, in their company, but I, I sh this, this becomes my case study. This is how not to do one. And uh, I'll, show, I'll tell them an analogy about, you know, if somebody, if you go on a date, the person talks about themselves. You hate it. Everybody hates it. And then I say, boom, look at this message. Do you think that person's doing that? Yes. So what are the chances of this person connecting? People yeah. nodding. They, they, don't need, they, they already know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So, but I'm surprised that people still do that. Second of all, sometimes just for the fun of it, I, I, I ask them. I, I actually replied back to say, I will appreciate it if you do some homework on my business before sending this message. Nine out of ten, they don't reply. Because they're going, they're going for the shotgun approach. Shotgun approach. They're going for the shotgun approach. Yeah. So when it comes to, to you were talking about the... Um, um, and this is part of the, the sales program that I, that, that I teach is referral selling. And you were talking about there are so many different channels. So that's why referral selling is so important. So just to, just to give you some, some quick stats, I was listening to Cape Talk last week. Um, I mean, and, and then the stats might vary depending on where you get your stats from, either from Hootsuite, from Forbes or South Africa somewhere. Okay. Take a guess how much ads we are faced with per day take a guess per day how many different ads mm. think about radio think about flyers think yeah. about when you go to the shop so social media many? traditional wow I, I mean it must be everything it must be it must be over a thousand i would say around a thousand maybe so on cape on cape talk uh, to south african uh, branding agency they say 1900 Wow. In America, it's between four thousand to ten thousand, which I can believe. Yeah. So yeah. the so the question is, and another thing is, ad blockers are the one of the biggest things people download. I've got a download ad blocker. Yeah. I, I switch over the trackers. I, I there's something called Ghostry that I use. It, it blocks all the ads. I love it. Okay. So here's the thing: you're faced with so many. If, let's say even a thousand marketing message, and yeah. how are you supposed to cut through clutter? And we all know word of mouth brings you a lot more sales. It brings you at least five times the sell. 85% yeah. of the SMEs are discovered by word of mouth. And one third of them leads to sales. So that's why referral selling is so important. 
But when I say referral selling, there's actually a strategy. Because you'll be surprised when I speak to business owners, how much, how much of your business is coming from referral? Oh, more than half. Okay. Well, how often are you guys asking for a referral? Yeah. Silence. Silence. Yeah. But when I say referral, I'm not talking about, hey, uh, Gideon, if you, need, if you know somebody that needs to do a sales program, uh, think of me. That's not referral. Okay. So, so let me, and this is where you storytelling. Like or like if, if you send somebody my way, we'll pay you back. Do you mean something like that? Like a real. No, no, no. I'm talking about with the actual strategy. So okay. this is go, this is what I call one level up. So you go a little bit further. So let's say if I work, let's say me and you, are, are you, you did my storytelling workshop. And I'll say, so Gideon, before we met, um, you admit that your sales story was a bit bland. It was lacking things. It was just products and services. There was no soul. But after that, we came up with this catchy thing and you absolutely love it and people are able to repeat it. So I'll tell you who I want to attract. I know that you are connected to, uh, from LinkedIn, I know you're connected to this person, that person, that person. Do you think that they will find this useful? And do you know them well enough so you can do introduction? Okay. Yeah. You see how specific that is? Yeah. Yeah. And then you go a step further that I'll tell you what, if you're okay with it, I will type out an intro. You just need to copy paste. Oh, nice. Make it easy for them. Yeah. Yes. Don't make people jump. And you know, it works. Because I've been doing that. People love it because you're making it easier. Because you know what to say. You're not making them think, oh, I worked with Gideon on the podcast. What actually must I say? Oh, I don't actually know. Make it yeah. easier for them. Because you know what your selling points are. I really like so, the first two questions. Like, uh, do you think that this, or how well do you know this person? Do you, well, do you know them well enough to message them? And then also, do you think that yes. they would be interested in this product? I think that's amazing. Because if they say yes then it's, they, they're going to want to connect you. If they say that, yes, they would be interested in what you're offering, then it's almost like they, they, by doing the right thing, they are connecting you. And, and, and that's the difference between cold lead and warm lead. Cold, I mean, a lead is not somebody's telephone number. So, so my definition of a warm lead is somebody is expecting your call and they know what the call is about. Okay. okay. And not like, so I got your number, num number from John. Who? John, that you went to school with. Okay, I haven't spoken to him for years. What's it about? That's a cold lead. But yeah. if I phone you and say, hey, hey, um, let's say Mr. I don't want to use any brand now. Mr. XYZ, brand manager. Uh, Gideon said, uh, I believe Gideon did an uh, introduction for us. Is this a good time to speak? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I've been expecting your call. Yes, let's, let's talk now. That's a warm lead story. because they know what you're going to talk about. That is what I'm talking about when it comes to referral selling. There's an actual a, a strategy behind it. Yeah. Because I've so far I've built my business on referral selling. And again, over the years, I've been documenting center process. And these are all transferable skills. And it's sad because people don't know how to they don't ask for referrals. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually true. Like, I mean, I'm I'm gonna own up to that now and say that I haven't I haven't done that too much in the last sort of year and a year and a bit that I've been running a small business. Like I I've never done that. I haven't really had a strategy. So that's I can imagine there's a ton of people out there who haven't done that. And I'm talking about like make a list there. Make a list and then divide them into different, different segments. For example, your clients in banking, your clients in insurance, your clients in finance. Divide them into segments and write down the names that's connected to there. And who are their connection? So go on to LinkedIn. So let's say use uh, Mr. Warren. I won't mention his surname, but Mr. Warren, you know who you are. Go on to his connection and see who he's connected to and who you want to potentially speak to. And say to Warren, like, listen, I would like to be connected to this person, this person. Do you know them well enough to do an intro? Instead so of like, trying to, instead yeah. of, instead of like just trying to search on Google, that's cold, dude. That's colder than, I don't even know what the analogy is. It's colder than an ice cube in the freezer. <laughs> that's pretty cold. No, that's, that's so true. <laughs> like I've, um, so, so anybody who works in marketing or anyone who has a business who's trying to pitch ideas to like bigger corporate companies and stuff will know how, if, if you don't have a friend, I mean, somebody wants Gatekeepers, to, eh? they will shut you down. They, they, oh, speaking of which, have you ever heard, this is how they shut you down. Send us a proposal. Yeah. No, you never hear back from them. Yeah. Yes. Because that's the biggest, that's, that's a way of, that's their way of giving you a backhand. Yeah. They're not going to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been there before, so I know. And fair play. <laughs> fair play. That's why I love business because businesses, if your stuff is good enough and your pitch is good enough, then you get the job. And if not, then so be it. Like that's 
I, I respect business in that regard, but I know what it feels like to be on that side where you spend five hours putting together a proposal for this project that's going to be so cool and you put their branding all over it and you send it to them and then nothing. Never. So, and also, it, with, when, it comes to, when it comes to that, make sure you're speaking to the right person. Yeah. I'm talking about somebody... So within a, within a business dynamic, um, they are influencers. So influencer, the influencers won't always necessarily be on the team per se, or there are people that block the deal. I'll give you an example. So let's say you pitch a client, um, let's say podcast, okay. which is your game, and the marketing loves it. But who are the people that can block it? Ooh, finance, yeah. Yeah. finance, legal, PR, gatekeepers. Spot on. Right? Finance can be like, no, it's not in the budget. Legal will be like, oh, I don't know if I trust you enough to go on a podcast and speak your mind, but they won't say it, but they'll block the deal. I've been there before. That's why I know there's different layers. So you need to make sure all the parties are, 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 are um, on the same page. And especially come to, come to business. I'll, I'll, let me use an example. So let's say it's a family-run business, husband and wife. Let's say the wife is the admin lady and the husband is the CEO. She may not have the title, but she has influence. Mm. I don't like Gideon. You're gone. You're done. You're yeah. out. She yeah. might be the admin lady, but you're out. That's what I'm saying. It's, there's a lot of chess pieces in there. So my question is, are you playing chess or are you playing checkers? And the difference is checkers all look the same. Chess, you have to know Every single piece, strong point, weak point. Man, this is honestly so cool. Like I, I wish that we had had this chat, you know, a year ago, and we had met by then. But, um, but thank you for sharing this. Honestly, this is this is some really really good. What I like about your advice is that it's practical. Do you know what I mean? It's not some high level Tim Ferriss, Simon Sinek stuff, which is, <laughs> and it has its place in the world. But this is actually this is practical. Like I. I'm going to go and create a referral strategy and stuff like that. What do you think about um, if you're selling a, a product or service where you're going to get uh, recurring customers, so they're going to come and buy it again and again in future. Um, what do you think about offering some sort of actual re referral program where you say, hey, if, if you guys refer, if your business refers a client to us, we pay you X amount um, in return because you know that then over time, you will then earn back that amount and then you'll keep earning from that customer every month. Look, I know, I know a lot of uh, people do it, but it, it depends. depends who you're speaking to. Let's say you want to offer a referral fee. Let's say, I don't know, let's make up a... Because I know your basic package starts off with 1,200 for two episodes, right? Yeah. So let's... You see, I've done my homework. See, Gideon? As an example. Yeah. So you, got, you got three packages. I know that. So as an example, let's use the beginner's one. And you want to offer uh, somebody a referral fee of 500. And this is a big corporate. 500 bucks for a big corporate dropping the ocean they don't care yeah. yeah but if it's for a business owner that's different so you that's what i'm saying you need to know your target audience why should the marketing person at a big corporate care about a referral fee they they don't even get it yeah so it's, it depends on so it comes down to what they value more, more for some people as an example so i do public speaking sometimes it's worth more than me more for me to get high quality photos and videos of me in action there to pay me. Mm, interesting. So find out what's valuable for them. That, I'm so glad that you brought that, that example up as well, uh, because I was speaking to someone and again, I won't mention names, but uh, she's very hot. But you want to. I would love to, <laughs> but uh, speak to me afterwards. No, I'm kidding. No, but, uh, <laughs> She's a hotshot lawyer, right? And so she does a lot of talking in the, in the uh, media and on, on, on uh, sort of public uh, cases with certain companies. And so she's built a very big personal brand, right? And so she, uh, she goes to like, let's say schools or places and she goes and gives talks about what she does, uh, but to younger people. So like, let's say she'll go to a private school here in Joburg and give a talk to inspire the young kids. Like high school students, high school students. High school students, but let's say for a private school, right? She, okay. goes, she gives a talk. Yes, they pay her uh, for the talk or maybe they buy some of her books as a way to pay her for the talk. But that's not where she makes her money and that's not her business. What she does after that is she goes, she makes herself a coffee. She goes and sits at the back in the corner. Parents, the parents. For parents to come through and say, hey, I just had something that happened to, to me. It's a huge mess up. I need your help with it. And that's where she does her business. So she's got the public 
speaking where she puts her name out there. Like you said, she tells a story and she shows people that she knows what she's talking about, but that's not her business. Once people trust her, they know who she is. She sits at the back and that's where the business comes from. You see, expert positioning. You need to know your stuff. You need to have a personality. You need airtime. You just confirm all three of them. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And you can do that. I mean, that's, I guess that's like a framework that you can, you can apply anywhere. You can do that by posting videos or, or conversations online by, you know, hosting webinars, whatever it is, like you can apply that framework to, um, to, to wherever you are using social media these days. Look, pretty much it, but uh, you, you have to, look, we only have certain numbers of day and I, I learned this the hard way. So like the big thing for me this year is, for me, it's a year of focus. Instead of chasing opportunities, I need to focus on certain things because I know what my end goal is. My end goal is I want to be a highly referred uh, storytelling sales coach among growing businesses with a culture of learning. That's my end goal. So if, if I do something and it's not going to help me achieve that end goal, might seem like a great opportunity, but I, I might say no. I might say no to it. But that's, that's, just, that's just me personally because uh, we, we all have different goals. But if you just want to pay the bills, you just want to hustle and do any gig, then by all means do it. Eh? It's like, I'm not there to tell people how to run their business. I'm talk, just talking about for me personally, because I want to leave. I mean, this is all, this is Gideon. This is all I know. <laughs> this is all I know. This is all I got. Yeah. But I mean, over time that, 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 that's now allowed you to be an expert in this field, as opposed to being a bit of a jack of all trades, which I'll be honest, like I sometimes feel a bit like I can do a bit of this and that and this and that and that, but I see people who are like experts in one or two areas. And I think that there's a lot of value in that. So over time, something that over helps. time and also experts get specialists get paid more. Again, think about GP versus specialist. GP yeah. might charge a few hundred specialist goes from a thousand bucks and up. Spot on. Yeah. And, and, and people pay for that gladly because of they've earned that knowledge. So man, yeah. don't get it. Me started. I went to a specialist literally in enough 15 minutes and it was like 1,500. I'm like, are you freaking yeah. kidding me? But then again, it's the years and years of experience it's, that it's they cool. are able to diagnose it in 15 minutes. Yeah. Instead of get in quick, let me just quickly Google. How do you spell that disease? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we, we know what happens when you Google your symptoms. Uh, you, you, yeah. Yeah. You, you think you have cancer, especially yeah. with web, WebMD. Every time you go on WebMD, yeah. you think you have cancer of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. All right, Charles. So we've, uh, we've sort of reached the end here and, I, and I've run out of my time of yours. And so I just wanted to, to cover one last thing. And that's most of my listeners and, and the people who tune into Rory and, and my podcast, it's, it's younger people. It's people who are either going into university or in university or have, who have just come out of university. And, and selling is not something that, that we ever really get taught in school. Like, hey, one day I'm going to go and be a great salesperson. It's always like I'm going to be an engineer or a pilot or a doctor, whatever it is. And yet selling is, is probably the most rewarding and the most, I guess, like the most useful, one of the most useful skills in, in when you actually get into business and you see, you see how important it is. Like selling is everything. You got to sell yourself, your business, you got to sell Absolutely. Your, to your employees. Like sales is what drives business and, and anybody who's been in business will know that. So what, do you, what would you say to, to a slightly younger audience in terms of not, not looking at sales in a bad way, but actually understanding it for what it is and embracing it and getting better at it. I'm so glad you mentioned this because uh, this morning uh, I was on a podcast and uh, say I was, I was not across, I was doing a, 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 like a mini seminar and I ran a poll and these are seasoned business professionals. They've been in business for years. You might even know some of the brand. And I said, I, I ran a poll and, and that's your point exactly. I asked them, how many of you were taught sales in your life or had sales training? 85% of them never had, but yeah. yet they are, they must go around a business, but you've never been told how to sell. And, 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 and that's the thing. Everything we either it's tangible or intangible. You're selling a restaurant is selling an atmosphere. A doctor is selling knowledge. When you go for a job interview, you're selling your story. So the quicker you can start making notes and practicing on it, the better it's going to serve you. So I'm going to leave you with one, one short story about how impactful it is. Think about it this way. When you graduate your, let's say varsity or high school, there's about a thousand of you. And 
perhaps uh, when you get to varsity, by the time you graduate, maybe there's 100, 200 of you in a class of, let's say, BCom. And you're not, and all of you are going to be applying for a certain job. Mm. You come out with the same qualification, same piece of paper. What do you think is going to separate you? Communication skills, and that's your selling skills. So one of my favorite stories that I've been, I've been telling over and over is, which I want to share with your, your, your uh, listeners is, this friend of mine, her name is Natalie, and she's what they call a change agent. Did I ever tell you the story? Not yet. Okay. Change agent. She decided to go for an interview, and uh, the interview wasn't going really well. It's very intimidating. One person sitting like this versus five people. And uh, this, uh, one of the head of the department asked her, so Natalie, what is your change management philosophy? At this point, she's like, oh, heck with it. So, um, so Gideon, Natalie says, my change management philosophy is dog shit. <laughs> They're like, what? So, well, I have a dog. I have a dog. I have a dog. Don't get it twisted. I have a dog. And I take my dog to the dog park. And the dog park is beautiful, except for there's lots of dog poo. So I, the good citizen, I bring my doggy bag and I clean it up. Whenever I see somebody don't do it, I run up to them. Hey, Gideon, your dog did number two. Clean it up. And they normally tell her to buzz off. Some of them use language which I can't uh, repeat on the show. You can, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. <laughs> this happened a few times. She's like, okay, I have to change my approach. She starts bringing in plastic bags and she starts going to people and say, Hey, Gideon, listen, um, you probably forgot your, 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 your doggy bag. Um, Hey, have, have one, take mine. Yeah. And then people listen. And over time, the dog park got cleaner and cleaner. So she said, this is my change management philosophy. You cannot force people to do something. You need to empower them and let them experience it myself. Now let's say 10 people apply, same experience, same piece of paper, same grades, who do you think is going to get the job? Yeah. Because she's able to communicate it. Yeah. And, and you know what? I have to, I have to, I have to, um, I have to break it to you guys that think about it this way. Do you think you're going to get paid 10% more if you had 70 versus 75% on your report card? Do you think a company is going to pay you more? Unless, unless, unless this is what we're talking about, let's say, um, highly specialized skill, like let's say doctors, engineers, or whatever, yeah, maybe actually, that five percent yeah. makes a difference. But your no, actual, so. no, Definitely. that's my point. Yeah. So, learn, drink from good books, read as much as you can, ask questions, start practicing telling your story. So, when I, when I, okay, just to end up on that point, when I say story, I'm not talking about telling people a soppy background about how a disadvantage and this and that. When they, when people you you will get asked this during an interview, and that is, tell me your story. People ask you that. Tell me your story. They're not asking you to tell your history. They're asking to find out how you can help the company perform better at your position when they hire you. Yeah, that's what they're asking for. So you need to be able to craft it. For example, uh, I did this certain project, and I was able to overcome it uh, with this and this and this. It was many many late nights, but I didn't want to give up. So so they so when you're telling that they say okay character perseverance grit instead yeah. of saying, saying to people yes transparency yes absolutely dedication yes absolutely you know you're communicating yeah yeah no spot on no th thank you so much for sharing that and honestly yeah to anyone who's listening to this um charles i'm gonna i'm gonna add your website um flyingkite.co.za in in the notes below this in youtube or, or if you're on apple Podcasts, it'll be there as well um but yeah please i really encourage people to go and check out flyingkite.co.za um, i'm gonna link to your instagram to sorry not to your instagram but to your linkedin and your youtube channel as well where you share weekly content um where you're dropping golden nuggets every week so so i, I really mean that I, I honestly i encourage you to go across and check it out and get in touch with Charles. Um, if you're a business owner or you have a team of employees, go and check out his courses. Um, if you're struggling with sales. Um, yeah, honestly, uh, that's all I can say is being someone in business. Yeah. I realized sales is the most important skill and it's quite sad when, when you see and you meet brilliant people who've come up with great products and great ideas, um, who never land their first customer either because they don't have the confidence to go out and make the sale or they just do a terrible job at, at selling it and they give up. So Sales, sales is everything uh, in the marketplace, I believe. And um, 
yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to put in your referral strategy. I'm going to put it into play as soon as possible. And I'll let you know, I know you've been following up, but I'll let you know. how that. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, I appreciate you and thank you very much. Gideon, you know what, if, if we were doing this face to face, I'll give you a handshake and a hug because yeah. I love your passion and that you're doing great work. You have that drive. Uh, I will have no doubt you will be reaping the rewards because you're putting in the effort right now. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm also going to put, I did a recap of all the things that you went through. So I'm going to put that in the show notes as well, just so people know what's coming up. Awesome. Thanks a lot, man.